Welcome back to another podcast episode where we help aspiring developers get jobs and junior developers grow. On this episode, we're going to be reviewing Actualize. So I invited a couple of software engineers on um, and I actually forgot when you guys graduated, but we're about to do intros. So if you want to tell us when you graduated and kind of what you're aiming for, or where you're at, it'd be super helpful. Daniel, we'll go ahead and start with you. Sure. So my name is Dan Onakani. I graduated from Actualize in 2019. Um, I think September 2019, I finished. Um, I'm currently a security engineer at a IT consulting company in Westchester, PA. All right, thank you. Um, and I'll just go left to right on my screen. Um, I'm Don, software engineer for a few different companies. And then beginning of last year, started my own company to help out software engineers. So that's pretty much me. How about you, Dan? Yeah, so I'm Dan, graduated Actualize, also in 2019, but in May. And uh, I work as a software engineer for a uh, Fortune 500 uh, insurance firm. Okay, very cool. Well, I definitely did a little bit of digging into Actualize. This is another high-rated coding boot camp, and we kind of just talked about there how many coding boot camps are out there. So again, this is why we do these episodes to dig into this a little bit. Uh, but where I like to start is the application process, because I think the application process is a huge part of the people that they bring in, and ultimately the pe what those people are going to do when they come out of the coding boot camp and what their outcomes are going to be. I think it starts with the application process. So um, I think both of you kind of saw my video a little bit. So feel free to just speak up when you have a response. But what did you think of the application process at Actualize? I mean, I'd have to say it was easy. Uh, so like I was, I was referred to Actualize uh, from another graduate and literally I looked on the website and the, the whole app, basically I felt like it, it described me and it took, I'd say 15 minutes to actually fill out completely and then submit. And then, I mean, you hear a response. I mean, I felt like it was next business day, but I think I actually did it on a Friday. And so, you know, maybe heard over, you know, heard from them on Monday sort of thing. So it was easy. It was fast. Um, couldn't really ask for anything more in that, in that regard. Hmm. Yeah. I can't really, I can't really add to that. I think it was, I'm honestly having a hard time remembering the application, which probably tells me that it wasn't terribly, uh, like it wasn't, uh, it wasn't super in depth into like getting to, I don't, I don't, I don't think it was anything, uh, like, um, like I know there's a lot of uh, applications out there. Like I know App Academy, I think has a pretty uh, intuitive application process. Um, not that I'd not say anything on Actualize, but I think Actualize is a little bit more laid back approach. Um, yeah. Definitely more open to many other avenues of applicants, I think was their main thing. Yeah, it definitely made it feel like, because I have a non-traditional background just in general and uh, I wasn't, I didn't get the feeling of being intimidated, even just filling out the application. Like I'm already going to look into doing something so um, out of my norm. So the application didn't scare me away. So I'd say that that's a good thing. Okay. Yeah. So there's definitely pros and cons with an easy application process. One I mean, it is a non-traditional path. That's what a coding bootcamp is. And it can be intimidating when you have no experience with programming to all of a sudden kind of like meet this gatekeeper into the industry when that's what you were trying to avoid in the first place with a college. Um, and I think, and I, I've noticed even some review sites kind of mention it's a more positive thing to have an easier application process because it makes people feel more comfortable, it's more inclusive, and um, it's more welcoming. Now, the con of that, and this I noticed with a couple of reviews as well, is one, I think typically a lot of the outcomes from the coding boot camp are a little bit better when you, ha when you really filter out the people and make sure they're ready to go in. 
and the dropout rates are a little bit less as well. Um, and one main concern, and I saw this with the reviews as well, but I want to hear your opinion about this. Um, sometimes you let in people that are at a very low skill level when maybe a good chunk of the class is kind of ready for the boot camp and some still need to be caught up. And what tends to happen is a coding boot camp will slow that class down to catch those people up. That's what you're going to see in a lot of educational programs. Do you feel like that was ever a thing? Did you notice that in your cohort? I don't, uh, I don't think in my cohort, no. Um, I, I definitely agree. I think obviously with a, like a, a more standard or traditional application process, like with a college, um, you have that filtering out uh, process through an admissions, you know, through going through admissions, having people review your application, mm -hmm. interviews if needed. You know, you have resumes that you send in or um, um, your, your grades, so on and so forth. Um, with Actualize, you know, they, the application process was very open, wasn't intense, um, but they do have a month of pre-work once you're accepted. So I can't speak for other uh, boot campers at other code, uh, coding boot camps, but actually we had a month of pre-work. Um, it was all on demand. Um, it started with very, very basic. Um, and I think it stayed in that realm of basic, um, like kind of a ramp to boot camp academia in a sense. So it was kind of like beginner to level one, then it moved up to like beginner to level two, beginner to level three, if you want to like kind of follow that scale just to make sure you had a foundation for day one of the boot camp for the live instruction. So I felt that was a really good, really good intro for all, most skill levels. Um, and like for me, starting especially, like I wasn't terribly technical um, at all with my skill set. And I felt like that was a very comfortable way of leaning into it. Um, so, you know, I'm sure other experiences are different. Some people probably find it more difficult or maybe they found it to be a breeze and they were just waiting to start day one. But for me, I felt like that was a pretty good, that was a pretty good guideline to get started. Yeah. I, I would say I don't quite, I didn't feel like we had to adjust the pace um, of the actual boot camp because, Oh, Hey, some folks were necessary, you know, weren't, moving along as quickly as others because you know to daniel's point you know that month of pre-work i think did the weeding out for for us um yeah the application was pretty simple it made it made you feel like literally anyone didn't matter your background you could just go in and try this thing out well then that pre-work i guess to me almost felt like that um, free look period, if, if you want to call it that, Hey, test it out. Can you do get the concept of, of variables or objects, you know, kind of what they're used for. Um, so I, I, I think once we got past that, because in that pre-work, I do know not everyone followed through. Um, I think there was one person that did the pre-work, but ended up not actually going through the actual boot camp, And so, um, again, yeah, there's probably other, you know, experiences, but I feel like it did a pretty good job. And, um, at least from, from my point of view as well. Okay. All right. Interesting. Do you feel like, let me think, how do I want to ask this? Um, okay. So actually with the pre-work, you mentioned people had dropped out. Was that by choice or was there kind of like a certain test at the end of the free work where they recommended you shouldn't move forward? It, it was definitely by choice. Um, you know, there was, so at, at the end of the free work, it wasn't like, Oh, you had a pass with certain grade or certain um, expectation. It was it kind of, you had to take a real good look at yourself and assess is this for me right now um because we actually did have um someone in my class that had joined um that started actualized maybe i think it was the year like almost a full year prior but because of personal reasons it just 
it wasn't a, a good time. Could not put in. I mean, because it's our. I mean, it's grueling hours, as as folks that are looking at boot camps might might realize. Um, and so he had a drop off from his initial session, but then he picked up in my session, you know, uh, with a year gap in between. Um, and so I, at least in, in my instance, I, I believe it was someone actually taking a, a, a look, Hey, is this for me? Is this the right time for me? Um, and actualize, I think is pretty flexible with that as well. And on, in understanding because you do have a mentor within that pre-work. So you do have someone, if you're not understanding something um, from the, the material that they give you, there's, there's an instructor that you can call on and you still meet, um, you know, a few times a week and you can ask them questions for hours and we utilize Slack and message them throughout the day. So um, plenty of opportunity there. Okay. All right. It sounds sounds very welcoming and i think the so you're you have a very mature mindset about that and it's about self-awareness and it's about recognizing whether you can do it or not and i i love people going into coding boot camps with that mindset i've met a lot of people that don't have that mindset and aren't able to analyze that um but that's that's really the only issue with that um it sounds very welcoming yeah. i do they offer like a, hey, there Kevin is. Hey, sorry for being late. Okay. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> Welcome, Kevin. All right. Uh, so, uh, Kevin, we'll actually do a quick intro for you, and then we're going to kind of like wrap up. We were talking about the application process, and uh, we're going to dive into the curriculum, kind of what you thought of it. How's that sound? Oh, yeah, that sounds great. All right. Well, welcome, Kevin. Go ahead and give us a little intro. Sure. Uh, I'm Kevin. Uh, I'm a junior at a college called St. Olaf College in Minnesota. Um, but I grew up in Japan. That's where I am right now. There's a train delay, which is very, very rare, which is why I'm late. Mm -hmm. Usually never happens, like only a few times, like in a year. But um, sorry about that. Um, but yeah, I did actualized boot camp um, in the summer. Um, got a few internships after that. And this summer I'll be um, interning as a software engineer at Best Buy and then probably working there full time after that. That's really cool. That's awesome. Congratulations. All right. Well, thanks for explaining that. I've uh, definitely been delayed going to work with plenty of trains in Chicago. So I, I know how those delays <laughs> kind of surprise you uh, but I, I'm glad you can make it for sure um, so Kevin we're kind of just wrapping up I think I pretty much got everything that I wanted out of the application process and I think we're ready to move on but before I do do any of you know if they required you to pay anything if you finish the pre-work of the coding boot camp and quit and decided it wasn't the right time for you it wasn't the right fit for you do you have to pay anything or do you get a refund if you did pay Mm -hmm. I'm not sure. Uh, yeah, I'm not, I'm not a hundred percent sure. I know that the way that they offer as far as payment goes is you can do, you know, either the whole thing up front or you can have it broken up over the course of the, the 16 weeks. So month to month sort of thing. Um, but I know from, from what I can remember, as far as the date of when I paid, it wasn't until after the pre-work was done is when I actually received my invoice okay. for the actual boot camp. It was afterwards. So, you know, I, I can't say if that's, oh, just because that's when they sent it or if it's, hey, you completed the coursework and now you're actually following through with the program. But if I remember, it was, it was definitely after the, the uh, pre-work was done. Okay. I think that sounds good. And I think um, to me, you know, you guys just make it seem like it's a very easy to entry access into the developer industry. That's kind of what the coding bootcamp advertises as. Um, that's what I see from the application process, but um, let's dive into the curriculum. What do you guys think of it? Yeah. <laughs> 
and and Kevin, feel free. Like if you just have something to say, feel free to just say it. It's kind of oh, sure. open conversation. Yeah, um, personally, so we learned um, Vue.js and Ruby on Rails, and they're not exactly the most marketable skills, to be completely honest. Um, I think a lot, I would imagine a lot of applicants had trouble, you know, um, trying to get positions um, since most positions are, you know, like React or Node.js, uh, .NET, Spring Boot. Um, so I guess I think the, in terms of the, the tech stack that we used, um, I think it wasn't the best for um, people trying to get into the job market, I think. Interesting. So why go into the coding bootcamp? Why choose that one? Yeah, well, at the time, you know, I had absolutely no idea as opposed to what skills were marketable and what skills were not. Um, so I guess I just com totally just trusted the bootcamp and everything. Um, and for me, it was fine since I'm still in college and whatever. Mm -hmm. But, and I, but uh, for, for people that are trying to become um, developers right after Actualize, it was probably tough trying to market their Ruby on Rails and Vue.js um, when that's, that's a very niche technology. Not too many companies use them. Yeah. Um, you know, Kev Kevin's absolutely right in the fact that uh, you really don't see a lot of Ruby on Rails jobs. Um, you know, and the, the program does touch on JavaScript. I, I'd say a, a decent amount. It's, it's not heavy. Um, and there's clearly, I mean, an, a, a, just a ton more JavaScript positions. However, the, the thing that, and, and this might be just because I'm probably older, slightly older than the average, uh, maybe the average person that was in my class, um, you know, the thing that Ruby on Rails really did teach you, though, um, was an object-oriented programming language. And if you, I guess the way that I marketed myself, and I was able, I, I graduated from Actualize May 9th of 2019, and I started my first day July 8th, 2019, um, at and I work for a principal financial group, which is a incredibly large um, insurance firm and, um, and it's global. Um, it's the way that I, I figured that I can market myself, because if you look at languages like Java, which I mean, if you have Java on your resume, you're going to get a job tomorrow. You're going to get a job. You'll get six jobs tomorrow. Um, Java is an object oriented programming language. And so when you kind of think about it like that, Yes, it's Ruby on Rails, but the basis is still the same because it's object-oriented programming. And you can apply the same thing to C Sharp um, or, you know, C++, yes, but, you know, C Sharp and, and Java. So I guess that's, that's kind of where I, I went with it. Um, and, you know, that's just, just one way, obviously, but... Uh, you know, Kevin is absolutely right. You know, you're not going to find a job really doing Ruby on Rails um, if that's really what you're what you're looking for. And Node.js versus Vue.js. I mean, you can actually get by, but um, you know, most companies are going to require more than just tech stack of oh yeah, Node.js and Vue.js. They want you to, you know, be able to do probably four other languages or for other technologies at that same time then. Um, so it was just, uh, so I guess my, my point in bringing that up is, you know, I, th I think uh, you just kind of have to be a little bit more critical about it and think of like the overarching of what they're teaching you when it comes to the curriculum, the overall idea of programming versus this specific language. Um, and going in with that kind of mindset, you, I think you might be able to um, pull out a couple other um, highlights from the program in their curriculum. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's a really interesting point. And um, you're right. Compared to Node.js, compared to React, 
Vue.js and Ruby, uh, Ruby and Rails, they're not nearly as marketable. And that's a really important thing to notice when you go into a coding bootcamp. And I actually challenged one coding bootcamp about it, but they were focused on entrepreneurs. They were focused on just a, an easy stack to learn to be able to put an application out. And that was a really interesting perspective on it. But I think Actualize does not focus on entrepreneurs. They focus on bringing no. people in as software engineers into the industry. So it's it's really important mm -hmm. to distinguish that. But I love, you know, Dan, what you said, like focus on advertising yourself as kind of like an object oriented experience programmer. And there are a lot like even with the coding boot camp that I went to, people would learn JavaScript and they would get a job um, where they would, you know, do Python or or Java yeah. or something like that. And that's very doable. You can market yourself as that. And I think a lot of junior positions, they just want to bring in people that fit uh, their culture, you know, that are likable yeah. and that are going to grow as software engineers that are humble. Um, so it's a really good point. So maybe it's challenging, but it's definitely doable. What did you think of, like, what did you think of the actual curriculum, though, when you were learning Ruby and Vue? Uh, did they teach it well? Did, uh, you know, were you able to kind of bridge the lessons as you kind of went on? Um, I'm, I'm actually kind of curious, like, what do you do in the curriculum? Mm. Exactly. What do you build? Yeah. So I guess the curriculum started off with creating RESTful APIs. So, um, yeah, RESTful APIs with Ruby on Rails for people watching. That's just, um, I guess, hard to explain that. Um, but yeah, we created RESTful APIs. Um, and then we did a little bit of front end, but not all that much. Yeah. Um, I guess my complaint I have with that, I think a lot of junior positions are like on the front end. Um, and for the most part, we focused on the back end at Actualize. Um, yeah. So I think it would have been better if they focused more on the front end. Um, and I think that would have made applicants or um, cohorts more. Uh, marketable in the job market because back in i think is mostly like computer science grads and whatnot yeah i i, I agree with kevin i think a lot from what i've seen um like a lot of the back end developers are more senior level um typically like an employer doesn't really want a junior level developer touching uh like business logic that because you know obviously like if you break if you break the logic um that can get a lot more trickier much faster as opposed to generally speaking um if you break a component yeah. or something on the front end um but i mean sometimes you'll find a junior developer doing like maybe some pair programming with a senior level developer on the back end if that company has the resources to do it um yeah but i mean i think in the sake of like a coding boot camp it I guess it depends. Like, I guess as the applicant, you need to do your own research and what you want to be or have an idea of what you want to try to achieve after the boot camp. Um, because if you're trying to get a job right after the boot camp, um, or like, you know, within like a, a, a shorter timeline, you probably want to focus on front end. So it's probably good to know if you're going to learn a lot of front end stuff at the boot camp as opposed to back end. I was really interested in back end logic that just kind of like worked out well for me just by coincidence. Um, Kevin, I don't know if you remember, we were in the same uh, boot camp. Yeah. Yeah. I remember you then. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <I don't> <laughs> um, so, you know, like we did a lot of back end stuff, which I just enjoyed. So I, I guess it really depends. Like you have to, it's a little bit of luck, but I'm sure if you do your fair amount of research, like you'll find a boot camp that fits the mold you want to, you want to kind of build into. A lot of boot camps focus on back end too. There aren't a yeah. lot of front end focused boot camps. And because I've, I've interviewed quite a bit and I've looked at course report through all of uh, a lot of the top rated ones. A lot of it focuses on back end. I got a question for you though. Why do you feel like typically companies aren't going to hire junior back end developers? What gives you that feeling? Well, I just think if you junior developers are obviously more prone to making a lot more mistakes, which to, you know, to whomever's watching, like that's okay. Obviously they make a lot of mistakes. It's going to happen. Um, but 
the back end is, you know, that's kind of like the money maker for a lot of businesses, whether uh, it, the business is benefiting, benefiting from a back end service directly, because it's a part of just like their day to day business. Um, or if it's like, you know, when you say back end, I also consider databases as back end. Yeah. So like you're housing all that data in there. If you disrupt something, um, that could be a terrible mess. Um, yeah. So I think, my opinion, that's probably why you see less junior level developers on the back end. Um, or I should say, you see less boot camp graduates in back end developer positions. And maybe like Kevin said, you might see more CS degrees in those positions because they had four years of in-depth learning and hopefully a lot of hands-on learning with backend. Um, Cause I know in college Just, curriculums, they, you learn a lot about databases alone. So yes, it, it just might be how it is. So this is uh, actually really interesting because I uh, honestly, my, my experience, especially like when interviewing, has been completely different, like completely polar opposite. So, um, you know, I, I mean, I've literally, I've only been doing, uh, doing this for a year, um, you know, a li little bit more, but I've worked there for, worked at my company now for a year and what is it like five months? And I primarily do only back end. Now, granted, I mean, I, and I think now that I think a little bit more about it, it's probably the, because of like, you know, the, the level of business, you know, how big the company is, because for example, you know, just the, where, where I'm working, I mean, we have three, four different sandboxes that you can develop and you can do all the back end work in, and you're not going to touch actual real data, but you have all your test data. You have your test databases, you have, you know, all these mock services, um, that you're able to actually play around with. Um, and granted they're, they're essentially copycats of, for us, what is our production data, but, um, you don't really have to touch it. And you, you know, I always have, like, I've got two senior folks that literally w look at everything I do and, you know, there's always some sort of like migration process. So, I'll develop something and before it even can like move into something. So let's just say the next stage, the next sandbox. I mean, you have three, four people like literally looking at every character that, that you're actually writing. Um, and so maybe that's, and maybe that's just like my experience. Cause I've only got the one um, because I, I was like super lucky to like somehow land the job, like, almost right away. Um, and I think for, cause I had gone on, I went on, I think it was like 33 interviews and I did 16 different like whiteboarding exercise, white whiteboarding. It's not an actual like whiteboard. Like they send you like a, a hacker rank login to, to do, um, at home or something. Um, but probably like 16 of those. And I think most of those were all like, Hey, write this in C sharp or write this in, in Java. Um, and I didn't <laughs> did it all in Ruby, but hopefully, you know, you know, cause it's, it's what I knew, but, um, it was more so for the, that backend. So it's really interesting to hear that. Um, Daniel, like, was that like most of what you were applying for? Like, did you find that most of it was for the front end stuff that they were looking at you for? I applied to like everything, quite honestly. Um, like I knew what I wanted to do, but I was not like, you know, I wasn't discriminating job, job posts at the time. Um, right. So I would say most of my jobs, that most of my job applications were actually full stack. Everybody, okay. everybody wants, a, everybody wants like a full stack developer. Um, yeah. So I think just by uh, just through like the entire application process is probably uh, it probably just shook out the more uh, full stack applications. Um, I but I did I did I did kind of stay away from front end because I just I generally was not interested um, in it. So it's basically yeah. full stack and back end were my were my go tos. Cool. 
Okay. Uh, that's interesting. Go ahead, Kevin. Yeah, I wasn't. Um, well, I guess uh, if you look, uh, if you like type in junior developer on like Indeed, a job board, um, basically all the postings are going to have like, you know, Java, you know, JavaScript, React or whatever, like yeah. almost all of them. And mm -hmm. it's very rare to find um, like a job posting that's like, like a, a junior job posting that's more like back and focused. So I think okay. as a new grad, as a graduate, as a junior developer, it's easier to enter the market on the front end. Not okay. saying it's yeah easier to enter. Yeah. 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 I, th so that's really interesting. And I, I'm actually going to touch on the JavaScript point because I want to go back to that you had mentioned that you learned JavaScript, but you weren't really comfortable with it coming out. Kind of touched on JavaScript, but that wasn't the focus. Um, do, would you recommend anyone going to this coding boot camp if they want to be more marketable to supplement that JavaScript knowledge? Yes. For me, like my answer to that is yes, like a hundred percent. Beef it up. Do even if it was something like a, a plural site thing, you know, watch a couple of videos, but um, just, yeah, something to beef it up. Um, cause you touch upon a little bit of it, but not nearly enough to, you know, if you needed to actually perform a hundred percent at a job. Okay. Uh, personally, I wouldn't, um, at, at least for our curriculum, um, we didn't really do front end. Basically we kind of, we used a temp, like they told us to basically, use like a template um, oh. for our project. We just sort of, for, that, for all of our front end, we just use a template. Um, and then we would make some like minor changes, but really by the end of the boot camp, no one really had a very good understanding of the front end. And mm. yeah. so Kevin, would you recommend it wouldn't really help you in the coding boot camp? But if you did learn JavaScript on your own and you supplemented it that way, whether it's before or after, it would help you with the job search. Yeah, but I suppose that goes for like any boot camp. So, um, yeah, if you if you do self study, then then yeah, that's going to help you in the job search. Well, I guess what I'm asking is because your mindset kind of was um, what you learned in the curriculum. It wasn't as marketable if you did learn JavaScript, if you did dive more into Node.js, if you did dive more into React. Mm. So some coding boot camps will teach you everything you need to know. And that, that's this misconception. I think some people that go into coding boot camps feel like the coding boot camp is only going to get you part of the way and you're responsible to get the rest of the way to become a professional developer. And some people that come out of a coding boot camp believe they were taught everything they need to at least get that first position. Everyone kind of has different opinions about this. So, yeah. I, and I think yeah. that's really interesting, but Kevin, I'm actually kind of asking you specifically because you uh, had wished that you had more marketable skills. Uh, do you feel like... Let me ask you it this way. Do you feel like with what you learned at Actualize that you are going to be just like you're going to be confident in getting your first developer position? Or do you feel like you have to learn more outside of that coding boot camp? Um, I think you definitely have to learn more. Um, uh, yeah, just have to like maybe learn React or um, some... It, yeah, it would be it would be tough to tough to land a junior position outside out of the boot camp. I think uh, like I, it's hard for me to say since I was a college kid. I was a freshman in the college, so I wasn't looking for jobs. I was looking for internships, which are a ton easier. But even for those, I actually had to do a lot of studying for. So yeah, I okay. guess I would say you would ha you would have to study. Mm -hmm. That's, outside. that's interesting. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, yeah, outside of the coding boot camp. That's really interesting. Let me ask you this. I usually ask this later on in the episode, but how many, first of all, how many people were in your cohorts? Yeah, I guess this is a little, we were an online cohort. We were yeah. 12 people. 
And I think we only coded like, like three hours a day. Um, so in a week it was only like maybe, yeah, around 20, 25 hours. And that just really isn't enough, um, to become a developer over the course of three months. Um, so yeah, I think that was, that was a big problem with the online system. We just, we didn't code enough to become developers in time. Yeah, I, I agree. I think pretty average person, probably 20, I would say, so during the work week, I think it was three hours. So like, let's just call it 15 hours during the work week, Monday through Friday. Like it's just, ideally it's not enough simply for something to mm -hmm. stick or something technical like programming Sunday. I think it was Sunday. So it was either Sunday or Saturday. It was an eight hour day, but I mean, that yeah. was composed of just like mul multiple things. So like that wasn't just coding. It was lecturing. Um, there was like, uh, I don't think career development in the beginning, but like there's like some other kind of like, uh, like job search, something kind of task, um, to help you with networking maybe, or something like that. So yeah, it's, it's not a, it's not a ton of coding, um, to where you would need it to be to make it glue and stick. Um, so that's kind of where it, it falls into, you gotta do a lot of self-study as well. Um, which is the, it, I mean, that's going to be the case for any developers professional career. Like you're, you're just going to be learning all the time. Um, so that should just be expected. You should just get used to that anyway. Um, but I agree. It, just, it wasn't, it, it was also meant, it was also meant for working professionals. So I think yeah. try to cram in as much as possible within a given amount of time. Uh, so not entirely their fault. Um, I guess they could have maybe made it longer, like the mandatory hours of learning from like 5.30 to 8, maybe 5.30 to 9, 5.30 to 10. It just kind of, you know, it, it depends, you know, how they want to establish that curriculum. Yeah, uh, I will, I think I will agree with the amount of coding time not being enough as, yeah, I mean, I mean, I think the class was what from six till nine thirty, uh, Monday through Thursday. And then it was, um, nine to five on Sundays and I, I'm in, uh, central standard time. Uh, I'm in Des Moines, Iowa. So, um, I was also online as well. And I definitely, uh, I mean, I was doing hours and hours on Saturday. I was doing hours and hours extra on Friday and like everywhere else in between, you know, if I had a lunch break at work, okay. Try to do a little extra study there because that the three hours during the week, it's, it's super, super, super tough. And now, you know, working in this, you know, for the full year, I, I code nine hours a day and I still go to class. You know, my, my work, you know, has me in class now three nights a week to continue. And I feel like it's still not enough though. And so I don't, you know, my, my whole point is like, I don't know what even would have been enough. Like, I don't know if there would have been like, Hey, if it was like, if we did this for five hours a day for 16 weeks or whatever, or even if the in-person class would have been enough because literally doing it all day, every day, and then still having to do more at, at home. It's like, I still feel like it's not enough because there's so many different technologies that, that pop up that you end up using um, that you've never even thought of stuff. I had never even heard of before. That's like, Oh, Hey, all right, you need to go learn this because you need to use it. So um, I wish there was a magic answer to the number of hours that you needed to put into it. Yeah, I would, I would say it's six months. I don't think that's a perfect number, but I like typically with three month part-time programs, I've heard the same feedback from other coding boot camps. So like you said, I don't think this is a diss towards actualize. I really don't. It's just the amount of time that they're allotting for you to actually complete the program. And it's really yeah. important to understand that as a working professional, um, 
I think, yeah, because working professionals are different. I mean, when I was transitioning, I know that I was in a space, well, I actually didn't have the money for it, but I thought I had the money for it. I quit my job and uh, started doing it full time and I kind of immersed myself into it. And it's a very different mindset to go through something like that. If I was a working professional and I had a stable job kind of on the side or I was in college and I was just finishing up my degree, I think it would have been much easier for me to accept that it might get me, like if I go through this part-time coding boot camp, it might get me, you know, 80% of the way there. And then I'm going to get the rest of the way um, to, to that 100% going forward. And I'm going to reach that on my own. And I might have to supplement a little bit because I'm not pressured. Because when people quit their full-time jobs or they don't have one and they say, pretty much you're like dedicating nine months of no income whatsoever, bare minimum to be able to go through a full-time immersive coding bootcamp. And you mm -hmm. expect that coding bootcamp to deliver. You expect that coding bootcamp to get you that job. But when you are a student, when you are a working professional, you have a little more time. As long as you have the patience, as long as you have the perseverance, you have that time um, to be able to wait a little bit longer than just graduating yeah. the coding bootcamp. So I'm glad you said about working professionals. Did you end up with like a portfolio of projects or did you get to work on any projects to showcase employers by the end of it? Just the one project. Um, that was probably, I think some of my biggest feedback in interviews, like I, you, you have one project and that's it. And so when they ask you, okay, what else, what else have you worked on? You know, that's where you, you tend to fall a little short. Right. And, and again, get... sorry. No, uh, no, again, no, no. The, yeah, the, the, our project, you know, they weren't all that impressive since most like impressive projects, at least at the junior level have uh, the complexity is in the UI and UX and the front end. Um, but since we didn't focus on that, it was very like hard to create, you know, marketable projects since all we did was create RESTful APIs in the back end. But right. I mean, it's not, there's not, you can't, it's hard to make a cool portfolio of projects with all you know is how to make RESTful APIs. Yeah, it is. And I, I think a lot of people that did focus on back end really struggled to create a portfolio because a portfolio mm -hmm. Typically, because you don't know who's going to look at it, right? Sometimes you're going to get a CTO that really doesn't care about how flashy it looks. They just care about how it works in the implementation. And um, if you get someone like that looking at it, great. But you also get recruiters. You also get other engineers that um, don't even really have access to your GitHub yet. They just kind of want to take a look at what you've built. Um, it's a tricky thing. Well, what did you think of the instructors? Oh, he was great. Yeah. Yeah. Our instructor was awesome. He was, he was incredibly responsive before and after hours. Um, and I, I generally, I mean, it helped that he was also a teacher in his previous profession. Um, and then he was also just a good programmer. So he's able, he was able to bind those two skills, uh, together really well. We also had really great TAs. I, I felt, um, they're all really helpful, very supportive. Um, and they were that I think personally they, they did a really good job helping you follow the breadcrumbs rather than just giving you the answer, um, which I think particularly in programming can be a big pitfall when somebody asks for a question or needs help with solving something. Um, and a lot of the time, yeah. if I know, you know, not on purpose or anything, but somebody can just give you the answer instead of making you think critically of how to solve it. Like their big thing they, they were huge on was how to understand read your errors, um, which was, I felt one of the big takeaways from the, the boot camp was I can, I can read this error. I know how to go find the answer now, which I think is invaluable. Um, so overall, like the teachers the responsiveness, the ability to help you learn how to think independently to solve your own problems. It was a, probably like a 10 out of 10 for me. I would second that. Okay. Well said. 
Yeah. So it sounds like the instructors did a really good job. Um, and part of one of the complaints I hear often with coding boot camps is if you're in part time, sometimes the instructors aren't as responsive. And I, I've heard a lot of instructors being more responsive in the full time immersive type of programs. And, you know, kudos to Actualize for pulling that off. That's really good. I think, and I say this almost every episode, an instructor or that like how it's being taught makes or breaks a coding boot camp. It changes the entire experience. And it sounds like it really kind of brought actualized together into a really good experience. Okay, so I think we're kind of ready to jump into um, what what kind of assistance do they give you with the job search? Do they provide mentorship? Do they look over your resume, LinkedIn? What kind of assistance do they give with that? Um. So they have, um, I guess towards the end of the boot camp, they give, they have so many dedicated, I mean, so they have a, they have a career counselor who is there throughout the whole boot camp, but she comes, she becomes more involved towards the end of it, how to market yourself, um, uh, crafting like LinkedIn messages to other developers or aspiring developers or recruiters, um, you know, how to just like engage in a conversation and just kind of like expand your network um, in that regard. Uh, setting up a resume. Um, trying to think what else. Uh, I guess like setting up, I think setting up a, like recruiting profiles as well, like different sort resources to go and do that. Like an Indeed or a Glassdoor or ZipRecruiter or um, name your like software developer specific niche recruiting website. So th there's a lot of options there. Um, so yeah, I think overall they, they did a pretty good job. There was there was one thing they did do which I disagreed with uh, vehemently, and that was putting the experience um, of attending the boot camp under work experience because that was always like a really awkward and tough sell um, when people would ask me, and every time I had an interview, they would ask me. And I just eventually took it off because I put under education instead. But I eventually took it out of work experience because it's just like I couldn't figure out a way to like articulate it in a way that made sense that it was work experience. Daniel, but overall, good. I want to emphasize that. I will. Sp so I made a LinkedIn post about that because I, I actually have a couple of remarks about more of the positive things, but specifically putting yourself as a software engineer at the coding boot camp that you went to. I made a LinkedIn post about this and I said, you're flat out lying. That's deceiving. You, you, that's not true. You're flat out lying to companies. You should not feel proud about that. And there's this notion that like developers need to do that because it is so saturated. And I think developers are desperate to get that job. But I am so glad you fought against that because that is 100% BS and you are not a software engineer at that coding boot camp. And what it does yeah. is you don't need to do that. It creates distrust immediately into the interview because now all of a sudden you have to backpedal and try to explain it. And like you said, it's really hard to explain that. And it's really hard to bridge that. And when a developer sees that you don't actually have the experience that you put, I mean, in my experience, you know, a lot of hiring managers are gonna be less interested and hiring you. And it's like shooting yourself in the foot. And so I'm just like, I guess I'm ranting about this, but I see so many aspiring developers doing it. I think it's a huge mistake. It creates distrust for junior developers. And I highly, if someone from Actualize ever listens to this podcast, I highly recommend they put a stop to that immediately because it's just going to hurt developers. It's going to hurt us in the industry. Um, and it's going to hurt yourself. Like I said, it's like shooting yourself on the foot before you even gave yourself a chance. So uh, kudos to you for fighting against that. Yeah, I mean, I don't think I was the only one. I know that I know I had conversations with others that like just felt weird about it. Um, and again, I don't want to I don't want that to overshadow a lot of the quality that yeah. they pushed out to us. Like overall, it was, I, I thought it was incredibly helpful. Um, and even uh, even after the boot camp very responsive, um, help, you know, and if you have questions, you know, set up a zoom call, like they're there, they help you. Um, but yeah, I just, it, it's, 
it wasn't a part of my story. Like that's how I approach my resume, my storytelling. Um, and to me, I could not do it in a way that I felt was appropriate or just made sense or was honest. Um, and I felt like I had more success after that once I changed it. So, yeah, I mean, wasn't for me. That, that's just, that's, that's just, that's it. Yeah, I think it was really interesting that they would go out of their way to help you craft a LinkedIn message, which seems so specific. Uh, that's interesting. I wish I had that. My coding boot camp didn't even do that. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I thought it was really helpful. Um, like throughout the entire boot camp, I was on LinkedIn, and then once they started helping us yeah. with it, I just started adding in like other little bits that they were showing us, um, and it definitely helped. It, it, not to say like my messages like weren't good, but you know, there's just like buzzwords that they teach you to throw in there. Um, or like little bits of experience or like just like little catchphrases to like help catch the viewer's eye so that they just, they just don't glance over and say, Oh, it's just like another, you know, it's another uh, software enthusiast who needs my help. Um, so yeah, I'm, yeah, it was, it was, it was great. I mean, it was very helpful. Okay. Anything unique or different than what Daniel mentioned for either of you? Uh, not unique, but again, you know, I just want to also agree with Daniel in, uh, the work experience and, uh, you know, in you as well, Don, because yeah, that's, that's a tough bullet to bite and you can't get yourself out of that situation in the interview and talk about awkward. Yep. That was probably some of my most awkward moments in an interview. And it was like, I forget after which interview it was where I was just like, I'm nope, I'm done. Um, and then switched it up and then like Daniel had much, you know, just much better luck. And I was upfront from the honest, no, I've never had a job doing this. That's why I wanted to get in, you know? Um, <clears throat> but the, the other thing that I, I would say that was unique though, is how much they harped on to fill out, just fill out applications. Um, and this is the thing that, um, for, so for me, I, I'm a, my background was in sales prior. I was doing sales and sales generally is it's a game of numbers. You know, you need to do X number of things to produce X result or Y result, whatever. And, you know, at least, uh, our, our, you know, I guess, um, coach, you know, to for your job coach, if you, if you want to call her that, um, she was like, fill out those apps, fill out the apps, fill out the apps. And I probably filled out 300 applications and had like 30 odd reviews or interviews. And, you know, so it was like, I'm glad that they harped on that. And I'm glad that that was something that they, they really focused on. Cause at the end of the day, yeah, you send out a thousand app, literally a thousand applications. Someone's going to call you like you're going to get something a job, I don't know, but, um, I'm glad that they stuck to that approach, even though I know that there was a lot of pushback, um, especially in my cohort, um, people just didn't feel comfortable doing it, but I'm glad I did. That's good. That's really good to hear. And, um, I, I think some people get stressed out over getting rejected so much. And I think there's some, Solace, there's some peace to understanding that it is a numbers game and that the rejection isn't necessarily because of you, right? It's maybe because you haven't put in enough applications because um, I can't emphasize enough, this market is oversaturated. A lot of boot camps forming, a lot of entry-level developers. It's really, really hard to get mm -hmm. in. And I would say 90% of developers don't, even, even with a little effort, they could stand out among many other developers. They just don't. And there's a lot of little yeah. things you can do to stand out, but um, I think it's really important to emphasize it is a numbers game. Okay, so kind of what I want to do, two final things, two final questions. Um, I want to go over like constructive criticism. What could they improve? And I also want to give kind of like one final piece of advice for developers. I always like doing that. But before I do, I kind of want to sum up some of the positive things. Um, so it's for, and I want you to correct me if I'm wrong. It's for working professional. Well, let's start with the application process. It's really easy to get in, not a really, uh, 
th there's not really much of a barrier to entry. So it allows working professionals that have no experience in the industry feel welcome into the industry. And it makes you, it sounds like the pre-work did a really good job of kind of preparing applicants to get into the program. And that's a really tricky thing to juggle when you have an easy application process. Um, you have to figure out how to bring in people of similar skill levels to make it effective for everyone. And that's a really tricky thing to do. And I, it sounds like Actualize has done that very well. So kudos to them for that. Um, it doesn't sound like a very mar marketable curriculum, but when we take into account that three months part-time isn't really enough, even if you were focused on JavaScript, even if you were focused on React, it's not really enough to get you all the way there doesn't mean you can't get a job. It just means you're probably going to have to supplement to be more marketable. It sounds like what you can do to supplement is learn JavaScript on the side, learn React on the side, look at your local job postings and figure out what does your community care about? What do the companies in your area care about? And it sounds like the instructors, and this is a big one, they're really good. Heard a lot of good feedback from instructors. And that definitely gives me confidence in this coding boot camp. And it also sounds like the job assistance is really good. I'm serious, Daniel. The fact that they would actually help you tailor your specific LinkedIn message seems so specific to me. I've never heard of that from any other coding boot camp. So again, that's another kudos to this coding boot camp. So with all that said, what could they do better? What would make them a better coding boot camp? I guess one thing, um, it sort of depends on your area, but you know, some places, Seattle, DC, New York, they'll ask a lot of um, leak code questions for interviews, a lot of algorithm data structure questions and mm -hmm. actualized did absolutely zero data structures and algorithms, like literally zero. So, um, for people who are trying to get jobs in those cities, it would have been literally impossible. So maybe adding, although with a three hour, three months, it's, yeah. So I guess maybe, I guess there just wasn't enough time to add that in for three hours, three months. Yeah, not sure. I think it's just like really, cause I agree all my, all of my whiteboarding interviews were like being able to like have, it was a lot of pseudo code. So if you just understand or you have depth and knowledge and understanding an algorithm and the data structure, like the pseudo coding is a lot easier. Whereas in a boot camp or at actualize, it's a lot of just like hands on really practical knowledge, just like, here's how you, t here's the syntax for a line of code. And it's like, that's where you start and you only go up. You know, like it's a lot deeper than that. And I didn't really learn anything about that until after the bootcamp because I was just having interviews where I, I had no idea like how to answer the question. So that I would agree hundred percent with what Kevin is noting. But again, it's like, well, it's for professionals. So where do you find the time to include that? Maybe you add it in on the weekend for the, the, the eight hour day, but it's once a week, like really beneficial, like perhaps to an extent, but it's not going to stick. So um, I'm just going to steal Kevin's actually, and I'm just going to double down. I think giving, providing the depth of knowledge of what code is, you know, it's just a culmination of data structures and algorithms. Um, and you, you need to understand that. So that's what I would, I would suggest as well. If, if they extended the coding bootcamp two weeks to do that and charged you maybe a thousand dollars more, or maybe a, a tiny bit, maybe 1500 more, would you pay for that? I guess, it dep I guess, I suppose it depends. Um, that's tough. I already mm -hmm. felt like it was too much money personally. Okay. I mean, and that's nothing against them. All the boot camps are really expensive. A matter of like, as a matter of fact, actualize isn't even close to being the most expensive. I know there's some that are much more. So, yeah. um, 
I don't know. I'm a, I'm a very big self study guy. So if I would have just had maybe some guidance, um, just like, Hey, maybe you should, like you guys should focus on this. Um, if you have spare time, like the owner or the guy who created actualized has a book on data structures and algorithms. So, yeah. you know, I, I have his book. Um, it's pretty good. So, you know, just picking up that book and just reading a couple pages every night definitely helps too. But yeah, I mean, when I pay extra, I don't know, prob- probably. I-, I was pretty sold at the time when during a, uh, during a boot camp, so I don't think I would have been deterred by another thousand or fifteen hundred dollars. But somebody else might have been. You know, that's it's another thousand dollars or so. So I don't know. It- it's a tough call. Yeah, I would uh, agree with Kevin and Daniel as far as um, what I would have liked to see more is that's honestly, that's really part of where I struggle on the day to day. And the, the other thing that I would have loved a little bit more of an introduction to um, is just like data archetyping. Um, you know, I'm, that's, that's kind of where <laughs> I've had a like come home every night and you know just it's just nonstop studying, study, study, and a lot of it's just trying to understand you know how things um, are actually structured within like an organization. You know, it's very different when you're just building a website. You know, like our project was for ourselves, but when you're trying to actually work within uh, an actual like ecosystem. That, I mean, it's a, it was a whole whole another ball game. So um, that would maybe be the only other thing I would add. Okay. I think that's really good feedback. Thank you. Thanks for being honest about that. Well, I think, honestly, I think everyone here did a really good job of not holding back, being very honest about what you thought. And I love that. And people are going to love that. They're going to appreciate that. And, you know, some of my guests, I think, they're a bit shy sometimes of like talking. They think that they're talking down about the coding boot camp, but what they're really doing when they give that constructive feedback, which you guys were very bold with, um, they trust what you have to say, the positive things that you have to say more. You're no longer salesmen that like, and you build that trust very early with them in the episode. And that's a lot of the feedback that I've gotten. So that's why I really like to dig into a coding boot camp to really flesh out um, the pros and the cons. So, that was good. So the final thing I love to do, what could be the final piece of feedback that we give for aspiring developers? Feel free to think about it. Mine's a little, uh, my, mine might be a bit against the grain. Uh, but what I learned after the boot camp is you don't, you don't have to become a developer like with your, your new skills. You can be a database admin, you can be front end, you can be back end, full stack, you could be a technical uh, analyst, you could be uh, a, a technical consultant. Um, like there's so many positions or you could be a product owner or a technical owner. There's like, there's so many different technical paths you can take that utilizes your skills. Um, and it's, they're, they're like ultra valuable. Um, so like, that was one of, that was one of my big takeaways is, uh, you know, you have these skills, you're not stuck. Like you don't have to be just a developer. There's so many other things you can do. I think a lot of people get caught up in becoming the developer and like, rightfully so it's a cool job. Um, but there's just more, you know, there's more out there. That's true. Yeah. I think my advice, my advice would be, um, like if you're gonna if you're gonna do this developer thing you have to go all in this like part-time just isn't gonna work part-time online you know dan was lucky enough to to find a job um but i I would say that was the minority at actualize probably Mm -hmm. out of our 12 person cohort maybe three people got jobs um full-time very so you know um so I would say go to a six month boot camp, go to a full time immersion boot camp, not an online one. Make sure that it has marketable. It's teaching um, like React, 
or yeah, make sure it's teaching React and make sure it teaches data structures and algorithms. Those are like the four things that every bootcamp needs, I think. I think that's a really good feedback. Thank you, Kevin. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's uh, both Daniel and Kevin. Like, yeah, that's awesome. Um, so I think the, the, the one piece of advice is just to be eager. Um, I, I feel like my, my attitude, uh, <laughs> whether it was in the interview or even in my, my job right now, like I am, I I'll say it, like, I'm probably the dumbest person on my team. And I think my eagerness to learn eagerness to just keep trying and trying and trying, um, that's been the, the constant feedback that I've gotten, whether it was like a peer review or even, you know, uh, you know, my, from my yearly review from, you know, my, my leader, um, having that quality overlooks like me not knowing even some, some like really basic, simple concepts. Um, and I, I think it, it actually does, it does go pretty far because I, you know, people want to work with people who want to learn and, and continue their, their growth, um, personally, and professionally. So, um, that's, that's probably where I would be at. It's also really good advice. I want to share something to tack on to that last piece of advice too. Um, when I was at the end of my coding boot camp, we would do these mock interviews with our head instructor. And the feedback that he gave me had nothing to do with my technical ability. It had nothing to do with what I knew or what I could possibly knew. It had to do with my demeanor. And granted, I was very tired. I didn't like my group, my last group at my coding boot camp. Um, and it was just kind of um, that full week at the end was very hard for me to get through. And what I did, and I didn't even notice this, and I would have done this all the way throughout my interviews because I was kind of exhausted from the coding boot camp. And he's like, why, like when you're working on a problem, you sigh all the time, stop it. And it was funny because like, like why would that matter? Like when I'm trying to think through a problem, um, I wasn't even thinking about like how I came across. I was just trying to solve it. In my head, I was actually having fun with the problem, but I'm sure like everything that built up with the coding boot camp, it just kind of showed off with just my demeanor. And it's interesting that you talk about this eagerness because when people go into interviews, sometimes, well, very often, when they're nervous, they freeze up. And instead of being eager to learn something new from that interview, uh, being eager to learn this new whiteboard problem or learn something from this professional developer that you have right next to you, they freeze up, they panic, and all they can think about is being judged, as being like not good enough for that interview or not, not a good enough candidate instead of having fun with the interview, instead of like letting loose, lightening up and relaxing, getting to know the person and just flat out sometimes saying, I'm stuck. I'm actually not sure. I'm going to walk through this idea in my head again. Um, maybe you could spot where I'm going wrong with this. And just ha like having fun and talking with the interviewer. And that eagerness will come out in your job, but it'll also come out in your interview. And I think that's really, really important to remember. And that's something that I didn't even see was happening to me until someone finally called it out in me. So maybe, it, maybe it's a little different than kind of what you were talking about, but that eagerness, I definitely... Mm -hmm. I think it's incredibly important in the interview as well. So I'm glad you brought that yeah. up. That's it. Again, thank you. Uh, let's do our outros. So what people usually do, um, if you have an app that you're trying to launch, that's fine. Um, a lot of people just say, hey, if you want to reach out to me, connect to me on LinkedIn. Some people just say goodbye. Whatever you want your outro to be. Um, we'll do our outros. So Daniel, how about you? Where could people reach you if they wanted to? Uh, they can reach me on my LinkedIn. Um, I guess you can just search Daniel Articani. It'll probably be the only Daniel Articani on LinkedIn. Uh, yeah, always free to talk. Um, have, you know, any conversation we can have to help you, uh, answer any questions. Happy to do it. Um, that's probably the only place you can reach me. I have like a Twitter, not very active on it. It's too much noise on there. So I stay away. Um, so yeah, LinkedIn's probably your best bet. 
Sounds good. Thanks, Daniel. Uh, for me, feel free to reach out to me wherever you found this podcast. Um, look up Don the Developer. You can find Don Hansen on LinkedIn. Um, I host a meetup. If you, it's actually a completely free meetup. It's a mentorship meetup. Even though we're based in Chicago, because everyone's online, I've been inviting everyone from all around the world to join and even just kind of do. We host like a monthly Q and A session where if you get stuck on something, you know, we're going to do our best to help you through it. But keep giving me feedback. Please comment. Please like. Please subscribe. I am trying to grow my podcast, and all three of those things really help out. So thank you for that. How about you, Dan? Yeah, so you can find me on LinkedIn as well. Uh, just, I think I'm actually uh, Dan Haynes on, on LinkedIn. Uh, and then also, um, so my work is hiring. We're always hiring. Um, uh, Principal Financial Group, uh, connect with me on LinkedIn first. And, uh, you know, I can kind of give you the lowdown if you see a position that you're kind of interested in. Um, but yeah, we're always hiring. Love it. It's a great place to work. Uh, they're allowing, you know, remote work right now, especially. Um, so it doesn't really matter where you're at. Cool. Thank you. Mm -hmm. How about you, Kevin? Um, yeah, I guess Kevin Nelson, maybe St. Olaf, LinkedIn, if you want to reach me there. Um, that's about it. <laughs> awesome. All right. Well, everyone, thanks so much for watching. Really appreciate all of you. And like I said, every single day, I keep getting feedback on what to do, what you like, what you don't. So please keep giving me it. And we're going to keep doing episodes like this. So Danielle, Dan, Kevin, thank you so much for hopping on. Really appreciate your time. And it was great getting to know you. Thanks. Appreciate it. Everything we believe. Everything.